we're talking about interviews today. My name's Claire Owen. I'm an assistant director at the Medical Schools Council. I'm going to start with a little bit of webinar etiquette. So if you want to ask questions, please use the Q&A button at the moment. Only use the chat button if you want to comment or ask for information or tech support. So we're going to be looking at the questions mainly, so make sure you use that button. Um, next one. OK, so yeah, this is what we're up to today. Uh, we have a welcome, uh, which I'm doing now. Um, I will introduce my wonderful panel that I have together here today. Um, and then we're going to do a little bit of a panel discussion and Gordon has a presentation to show everybody. And then we'll move into a Q&A section. So while people are presenting, please do put in your questions um, and we'll try and go through as many of those as possible. OK, so introductions. So as I've said, I'm Claire um, from the Med Medical Schools Council We're running this webinar today. I have Afshan Ahmad from Aston Medical School, Gordon Dent from Kiel, and Gail Nichols from Leeds Medical School. Um, really experienced group of admissions deans here today uh, to give you some advice and guidance. So we want to provide information on different types of interviews and what your students can be can expect when they're called for interviews. We want to answer those questions, anything that you'd always wanted to ask. Um, and we want to share the resources that MSC provides on interviews. So after we've done this webinar, um, my colleagues will prepare a sheet with relevant links and um, so that you can look at the resources that we've been talking about. We'll also put some something in the chat around um, where you can find things online. So I'm going to finish there and I'm going to hand over to Gordon. Thank you. Am I able to share my screen? Yeah, you should be able to. Right, so can everyone see a picture of a nice country house in the autumn sunshine? Okay, that is Keel Hall. I'm not trying to advertise it as a wedding venue or anything. Um, this is a presentation I gave to a group of students fairly recently. So it, it is kind of aimed at them, but it's information that's useful for uh, teachers and advisors to have um, for students who are coming up to having interviews. And the premise I'm going to start from is you're dealing with students at this time of year who've already gone through the process of getting to interview and you're now looking at how they're going to deal with uh, actually attending and uh, succeeding in interviews. So what's on this slide is going to seem like it's maybe not relevant anymore. So all these details about how students need to make a competitive application to improve their chances of being invited for interview, making sure they're meeting GCSE requirements, they know what UCAT thresholds are for various medical schools and so on. Um, and all these various things that are taken into consideration for uh, selecting for interview. And there's some variability in how students are selected for interview that's actually increased a bit since the pandemic. So there's, there's some things on here that weren't really things you'd have been looking at uh, pre-pandemic. And the last step that you would have been advising students on up to now would be applying to the right places. So applying to places that were looking for things that match their individual strengths. So does any of that matter anymore once they get to interview? Well, it really depends where they're being interviewed because there are some medical schools that continue to use some of these pre-interview measures in making decisions at later points. So the most common example would be parts of the UCAT being used as components of interviews or being combined with interview scores to make decisions on offers. Um, so there are places where the situational judgment test part of the UCAT, for example, is used as a proxy multiple mini interview station. So they'll be given a number of tasks to do on their interview day, but then one of the uh, another number that will be combined with the scores of their performances in the interview will be the banding they got for their um, SJT. Um, Norwich Medical School, the University of East Anglia, is quite heavy on uh, use of, of UCAT at the interview stage because they also combine the UCAT total score with the interview score to rank interview candidates for offers. Um, this use of 
components of UCAT within interviews seems to be increasing a little. Um, so as one example, Leicester this year, who used to run a numeracy station as part of their multiple mini interviews, because they can't do that currently, are using the quantitative reasoning score from the UCAT as a proxy uh, MMI station. So your students do need to look out for other examples of where things other than their performance on the day of the interview might count in whether they get uh, in, uh, offers. So things that um, students will be thinking about at this point will include what kinds of interviews there are, what kinds of things medical schools might be looking for, uh, the, the moment to find out about them in the interviews, what kinds of things they can do to prepare and by pre preparation here, I mean, what kinds of things they might need to know, uh, what information might they need to hand, uh, have to hand, what, what things might they need to have thought about. Um, what kinds of activities might they have to do as part of an interview and what kinds of things they can do or say in an interview might that make them stand out. Now on that last point, which is a question we get asked a lot, we could spend all day telling you what kinds of things make people stand out in a bad way. Uh, what makes people stand out in a good way is a little bit more subtle. So the types of interviews they may face, again, this has become a bit more varied since pandemic because obviously we all had to switch to doing online interviews, um, most of us for the two years uh, of lockdowns. And since we've opened up again, there have been some changes in circumstances for some medical schools about what spaces they have to interview in. Um, they may be retaining things that they've developed as part of online interviews and combining them with their face-to-face uh, -face interviews. And some will be staying with online interviews for reasons of efficiency or um, avoiding excessive travel costs for students and so on. So the kinds of things that students may face may be face-to-face -face interviews taking the form of multiple mini interviews, which may be similar to the multiple mini interviews that the medical schools were running before the pandemic. Uh, in some cases, looking at how medical schools are describing their MMIs, some of them look like a lot better than the ones that did before the pandemic. Um, some will do panel interviews either because that's what they did before the pandemic or because of lack of space or lack of resources that may have changed the format. Some things that your students need to look out for are um, particular approaches of individual medical schools that place an emphasis on particular things like ability to engage within groups. Um, so Southampton and Hull York Medical School for a long time have used uh, group tasks as part of their interview and seem to still be doing that. Um, so having an activity within the interview where the student works in a group with the other candidates mm -hmm. and gets observed to see how they engage with the group on uh, completing that task. For those that are still doing online interviews, these can take a variety of forms because some medical schools, when they shifted online, moved their multiple mini interviews online. Um, quite an ambitious thing to do, but some seem to have done it successfully. Um, some switched at that point to doing panel interviews because they're technologically less demanding. And some used a kind of hybrid or a, a sort of MMI that's not really an MMI. So um, something where students will go through a number of separate tasks in the same kind of way they would in a, a multiple mini interview, but maybe not with each of them being with a separate interviewer. Uh, a couple of medical schools in London during the pandemic developed something called asynchronous interviews where candidates were sent questions and were given a time frame in which to video themselves on their phones and upload their answers to those questions. And certainly at the um, beginning of this academic year, Imperial were planning to continue doing that this year and combine it with face-to-face -face, uh, multiple mini interview stations. So on the screen, I've got links to the Medical Schools Council website with some resources about types of interview. Um, and if you go to this page, you'll find that you can access a lot of information to do with preparation for interviews, details about how online interviews work and some specific details about preparing for those. Now, in various ways, 
um, the medical schools are going to be assessing your students on these kinds of things so that you can see on the screen at the moment I'm just trying to get rid of the chat window um, the reason one of the main reasons for doing interviews at all is to first of all get an opportunity to talk to the student themselves because anything we've seen before hasn't necessarily been produced by them so just to make sure that we're finding out what they know and what they think um, but then there are a few specific things that we want to be able to find out about them to see if medicine's a realistic option for them. Um, so many would say that the thing you need to demonstrate most convincingly in an interview is your ability to communicate effectively. And everything within an interview will involve communication, mostly verbal, but obviously there are elements of um, body language and other forms of nonverbal communication within them. And we may be trying to find out about examples of situations in which those students have demonstrated an ability to communicate effectively. So quite a lot of interviews will be looking for evidence that these students have done something that involved engaging with people and um, showing that they had particular skills that required to make people communicate with them to make sure that um, the understanding of their situation and the ability to communicate information to people who may have different ways of understanding has all been demonstrated. And we may ask for evidence of things like that. So we may ask about situations students have been in with have demonstrated those skills, or we may ask them to demonstrate it in front of us. And this is why a lot of multiple mini interviews in particular will contain role play stations where uh, students are given a scenario and an actor to engage with to demonstrate that they can understand what the actors experience and communicate with them well. Many medical schools will want to know that the students have an understanding of what it is that they're applying for, that they understand how healthcare teams work, what kinds of conditions they work under, uh, how different people within a healthcare team have different responsibilities and how dependent their success is on everyone knowing what their role is and fulfilling it properly. So we would like to find out about students' understanding of the role of a doctor specifically within the healthcare team. And students should be thinking about where can they get that information? How do they know what the role of a doctor is? They may have undertaken they can work experience in clinical settings, many cases they won't have, but they'll have found that information out from other things like web resources, online work experience programs and so on. And they may be given scenarios then to discuss where that understanding of the role of a doctor and healthcare team might be applied. So they may be given scenarios or they may be given examples of things that doctors may need to take responsibility for and ask what kinds of things doctors will be doing uh, to deal with those. Many, if not all, uh, medical school interviews will in some way explore ethical issues to do with medicine. This is how multiple mini interviews originated in Canada, actually. Uh, they were all about discussing ethical issues related to medicine. So this may be um, uh, evoked through asking specific questions about uh, medical ethics, or they may be about uh, giving the students scenarios that raise ethical issues and asking them to identify and discuss them. So for your students to have some awareness of ethical dimensions of medicine is always very useful and to have got into the habit of discussing those kinds of scenarios. And I do spend a lot of time telling sixth formers to try to uh, make friends with a philosophy or RE teacher because uh, those people are generally very good for if you can get into their diaries at all. Um, putting some time aside to have discussions with uh, groups of potential medics about ethical issues related to medicine. We would want to know that students have some awareness of the demands of being a healthcare professional. So do they know what responsibilities doctors have and other healthcare professionals have? Do they understand the importance of being able to work effectively in teams? And do they have evidence themselves of ability to treat people with respect, to handle responsibility when they're given something to do, to do it properly and do it on time? Um, some will want to see evidence of ability to handle numerical or graphical data. 
And this is not generally looking for high level math skills. It's looking for an ability to uh, apply maths that they should have learned in primary school or early in secondary school. Um, so some medical schools used to have numeracy stations within multiple mini interviews. Keele used to have a separate numeracy test that we haven't been able, unfortunately, to run online. Um, so seeing that candidates are comfortable with numbers and can recognize what a graph is showing tells us something about how they're going to deal with numerical aspects of uh, studying medicine and practicing it. And in some places they'll want to see whether students can engage with discussions about uh, medical scenarios that demonstrate their ability to identify issues that are raised, suggest approaches to dealing with them, and just demonstrate generally the ability to think critically about situations that are put in front of them. Um, sorry. There are one or two, I can think of one off the top of my head, I won't name it, I'll let you find it out, um, that will want to know that the students have specific awareness about the course they're being interviewed and about the location uh, where they will be studying. So finding out how much students understand about the style and delivery and content of the course that they're being interviewed for and demonstrating that they've thought about why that style of course may be appropriate for them. And uh, in this one example I'm thinking of, they may be asked, what do they know about the city where this is located? How are they going to deal with living here for five years? Do they actually know anything about uh, the place? Um, so again, there's uh, a link on the slide to Medical Schools Council resources about uh, the kinds of things that are being looked for within interviews and things students should be thinking about in preparation. One thing that students should try to find out before they go for interviews is whether their interviewers will have read their personal statement on their application or any other autobiographical information they put in through things like the roles and responsibilities form at Keele. Um, because many medical schools will not use personal statements as part of their selection for interview, but they may use them as a source of interview questions. So your students should be thinking about what did I put in my written application? Um, what would I be comfortable talking about and what do I wish I hadn't put there, uh, but need to have some uh, thoughts about before I go in, in case they ask me. And their personal statement should have represented their case for selection. So they should have it firmly embedded in their mind. They should know what it said about them. And there may have been things they put into their application that they'd only just started doing and they may get an opportunity to uh, talk about what they've done since the application went in and those uh, particular experiences that they're undertaking. Um, ethical issues raised by medical and social um, cases. There, there's often stories like this in the news. So Archie Battersby has been a big news story this year, for example. And they're the kinds of things you would expect prospective medical students to be taking some notice of. So they may get asked about those kinds of high profile cases, or they may be given other scenarios that raise similar sorts of questions. And an important thing to recognize here is that they're not just being asked to memorize something like the four pillars of medical ethics. When we used to do in-person interviews, it used to drive me mad when uh, candidates would keep reciting the four pillars of medical ethics, regardless of what question they've been asked. What we're really looking for in ethical scenarios is can students identify what ethical issues are raised and if it's appropriate to apply the pillars of medical ethics, how do they apply to that specific scenario? And they need to think a little bit more broadly about how ethical aspects may vary for different patient groups. So broadly, what rights do patients have, but what difference is there if the patient is elderly and suffering from dementia? or is a very young child, or is unconscious? What can doctors legitimately and legally do in particular situations and what can't they do and when might they need to seek advice from a court? And 
students need to demonstrate they understand what kinds of demands they will face as a doctor, but also as a medical student. So what's going to be different from them about people in other roles? So what particular demands are placed on doctors? And the first thing many candidates and in interviews will think to talk about is long working hours. Well, personally, I have to say I work long hours and I'm not a doctor. A lot of people have those kinds of demands on them of having to work for long hours and be making decisions all the time. But there are things that doctors need to do that most of us don't need to do. And what kinds of demands are placed on them professionally in terms of recognising what their role is and what they can do and how they need to work with their colleagues? What are the physical demands? Are they on their feet a lot? Is it physically exhausting? What are the emotional demands? I think we can all start to think of some of those, but your candidates for interview probably need to be thinking a bit more deeply than the rest of us about what kinds of emotional demands they might face as a doctor. And recognising that doctors have these demands on them, what kind of support do they have in the workplace? How much of that comes from their colleagues? How much of it is formal? And what might happen if they can't cope with it? If they find themselves behaving in ways that are not appropriate because they find it difficult to deal with these demands? Uh, and recognising then that because of the things that could happen to them if they behave unprofessionally, they have a responsibility to make sure they are seeking support and making sure they don't find themselves in that situation. But beyond this, it's also important that the students recognise what is different about being a medical student from being a student on many other university courses. And it's not just to do with workload. Um, medical students do have to do a lot because they have to learn a lot of things alongside each other. But things like demands to behave professionally apply to students from the day they start medical school, sometimes before that. Um, so recognising that they need to be aware of how they're presenting themselves, how they're behaving publicly is important. Um, Probably the most common reason for medical students getting into trouble, as it probably is for doctors getting into trouble, is inappropriate um, things being posted on social media, not always by the students or doctors themselves, sometimes by their friends. Um, so making sure that students recognise that these are things they're going to need to be careful about and be giving some thought to at this stage is quite important. And before they go into interviews, it's useful for students to have looked through Achieving Good Medical Practice, which is a guide produced by the General Medical Council for medical students mm -hmm. about the expectations on them to demonstrate uh, adherence to principles of good medical practice, which they will have to demonstrate throughout their careers. So in the way that they should have read the um, NHS constitution before they thought about applying, they should be reading Achieving Good Medical Practice before they go to an interview. And they should still be looking at the NHS constitution because again, one of the core reasons for us interviewing people is to see that they demonstrate behaviours that are consistent with the values of the NHS constitution. So the students should be having another look at this before they go into their interviews, thinking about what's the NHS constitution say about the purpose of the NHS, its obligations, and most significantly its values, because the students need to be demonstrating that those values are things that guide them and that their behaviours are uh, reflective of uh, holding those values. So the kinds of things they might have to do in an interview will vary from face-to-face -face questioning, as demonstrated down here, so that could take the form of being interviewed by a panel or it could be individual stations within a multiple mini interview where there are face to face one to one interviews. But particularly within multiple mini interviews where students are going around several stations with different tasks on each one, they may have to do other things like uh, interpretation and manipulation of data, working on a group task and two examples I gave you, or demonstrating their ability to engage with people in um, situations that mimic the kinds of things that come across in clinical practice. So here we've got somebody about to perform an injection on a frightened uh, patient. Now we're not going to put two kids together in an MMI station, but they may be asked to explain to somebody who's frightened what a procedure they're going to have would involve. And we're very much focusing there on how do they engage with the person and the fact that they're frightened rather than do they know how to perform the procedure or know what the procedure involves. So that kind of 
uh, ability to engage with people who are feeling upset, distressed, nervous, anxious, confused is all very useful and is all something that may well come up within role play stations in interviews. And it's something that students have undertaken a lot of experiences where they've engaged directly with people will be better prepared for. Um, this STAR technique is something um, I've heard a lot from careers advisors about a way to talk about experiences you've had to make sure you get the key points across before you get interrupted with other questions. And this is if, for example, you're asked to give an example of a situation where you demonstrated effective communication, to get all of these elements in, to say where you were, what you were supposed to be doing, so situation and task, how you actually went about doing what you've been asked to do, so your action, and the results. So how did the way in which you approached it lead to some kind of positive outcome? And if, when you're asked for examples of uh, situations you've been in, you can get through situation, task, action, results, you're telling complete stories rather than giving us fragments, and it will make a much better impression. Just come back to numeracy again, because a point that medical students really should understand is a doctor cannot be scared of numbers because they will be in positions where calculations they do or interpretation of graphs that they do in clinical settings may have significant uh, impacts on what happens to a patient. Now, if you're doing calculations, they're going to be checked. But even so, you want to be confident that you can get something right first time and say, right, you need to give them this dose of this drug straight away. And then somebody will check it and say, that's fine. If somebody checks it, gets a different answer to you, you're going to need to bring somebody else in and it'll just prolong the procedure. Similarly, there are quite a lot of graphs that need to be interpreted to decide what might be the appropriate um, uh, treatments to give. So the most common example used for this is this treatment line that shows the relationship between plasma uh, concentrations of paracetamol and somebody who's taken an overdose and how long it is since they took it that allows you to decide whether um, they will benefit from having a therapeutic intervention. So these kinds of things students should be able to do fairly confidently. And the kinds of things that will make students stand out in a good way would be demonstrating genuine motivation, enthusiasm, and showing that they have made the effort to find out what the role of a doctor is, how they engage with uh, healthcare teams, what kinds of responsibilities they need to deal with, what kinds of skills they need to develop, the importance of lifelong learning and so on. So showing that they understand what a doctor's role is and can show that they've put some effort into finding that out is going to make people stand out in a good way. Having some awareness of what's going on around them, particularly with regards to um, big news stories that are, uh, are related to health, um, scenarios bringing up uh, ethical issues where students can demonstrate their awareness of ethical principles and application of them and awareness of what the duties of doctors are in situations like having a global pandemic or having hospitals that are excluding visitors and so on. So preparation involves knowing what to expect from your interview, so what form it will take, what kinds of things may be covered in it knowing what they're going to learn as medical students so they can talk about um, how well the particular course they're being interviewed uh, for suits their learning style, understanding what doctors do and therefore what skills they're going to have to have and what personal characteristics they'll need to demonstrate, and having that kind of experience of working with people that will give them examples of when they've uh, had to communicate effectively or deal with somebody who is upset or distressed, and any evidence they have of having worked effectively in teams and showing an understanding of, of how teams work successfully. And it's important to recognise that preparation for an interview is not the same thing as rehearsal. Most interviews are very hostile to rehearsed answers, and we will tend to interrupt students if they're clearly giving rehearsed answers and ask them a different question or ask this question in a different way to try to get them off their script. So preparation is knowing what points you want to get across, not the words you're going to use. So if you could 
make sure that you're aware of these um, resources that are offered by the Medical Schools Council and make sure your students are accessing them. And when I gave this presentation to a group of students, I did say, if you don't bookmark this page, I'll have wasted the last 20 minutes. Um, so please do make sure that students are using these resources that are available to them. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Gordon, for that absolute tour de force of what to do with interviews. Um, absolutely priceless advice for everybody on there. Um, I have a new, new panellist has joined. Drew, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, sorry for the delay. We're in the middle of exams, so he's running slightly behind this morning. Uh, my name's Drew Tarmy. I'm head of admissions for the medical school in Manchester. Fantastic. Lovely to have you here, Drew. Um, so Gordon's given a really good overview there and I was just going to go around. I'll go to Afshan, then Gail, then Drew um, and just uh, just see if you want to add anything on top of that. Maybe describe your own interview process, that sort of thing. So Afshan. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. So I'm Afshan Ahmed. I'm one of the lecturers and the admissions lead for Aston Medical School and we're a relatively new medical school and um, the form of interview we use is MMI. So thank you very much, Gordon. I think you've said everything that I think we needed to cover, really. But just to talk a little bit about our own MMIs, we have seven stations and the form that our stations take, which is very much along the lines Gordon mentioned, are um, we'll have some stations where you have a scenario that you read and then we ask you questions around the scenarios, which address a lot of the things, um, which are things like, do you understand the limits of your competence? Do you understand um, how to make a decision in a difficult situation, how to prioritize, how to use people around you and um, feed into that sort of, you know, teamwork, leadership type of thing. So um, the scenario based ones with question answer, we also have straightforward question answer ones in trying to understand things about you, you know, how do you learn? Um, do you understand the extent of um, the, the sort of dedication and motivation you need in order to study and practice medicine? We also have um, simulated um, stations where you've got an actor and you have that interaction, which again is towards um, qualities that are needed in both a medical student and a doctor. Um, now, in terms of what do we base those multiple mini interviews on? Um, Gordon already touched on the NHS values, which are in the NHS constitution, and they're very important because you need to understand that in order to understand where you're going and what is expected of you. And we also map it to um, duties of a doctor registered with the GMC, and all of this is available on websites. So it kind of really gives you the basis for understanding and going forward with what you might be expected to answer. But one thing um, I would say is that it, it is important for you to practice, but the practice is more about understanding the question and knowing how to answer it. It isn't really about formulating those sentences and regurgitating those sentences in an MMI um, situation, because as Gordon said, it's very obvious when people come, they don't listen to the question, they kind of understand those keywords, and then they talk about it completely off, you know, off piste. It's, it sort of doesn't make sense because they haven't listened to the question or they haven't read the question. Um, and often, the guidance to your answer is given in the question um, because we use the words, we use scenarios which, which are there to make you think. So please listen to the questions or when you're reading, try and pick out the keywords and then answer relevant to the question you're being asked. That's the, that's the most important advice I can give you. I hope that's given you an idea. For Aston, we are doing our MMIs for the time being online. We, we did start doing them face to face, but we found, you know, with COVID and people traveling and international people having to come take the MMIs going back and being told they haven't got a place, it sort of um, takes all that out of the way if we do everything online. So we do do everything online. All our 
stations are tested online before we put them into practice. They're tested in the right age of people. So the language, the questions, everything is tested, tested, tested before we put them into practice. Thank you very much. I hope that's given you an idea of what we do at Aston. Brilliant. Thank you, Afshan. So that is read the question you've been asked, not the one you were hoping you might be asked. Um, fantastic. Gail, um, would you like to talk a bit about Leeds? Thank you, Claire. Thanks, Gordon and Afshan. You've covered most of the points. So I'm just going to just keep it really short here. Please read, get candidates to read what is sent to them. Make sure that they understand if they if there is an ID check beforehand. Um, some uh, places that are online will have an ID check on a separate day. And so there will be two interview slots. One is an ID check and one is the actual interview session. This is like a military procedure. And so if somebody turns up late, it is extremely unlikely that we are going to be able to get them into the process. And so that is one of the best things they can do is make sure that they're there on time. For the online interviews, there are different technological platforms. So orientating yourself to that platform before that day is really important. We can see that occasionally there are technical glitches despite what we do in everything in life. And so trying to iron out those glitches beforehand is really important because people don't want that as added anxiety that's hindering performance. Accessibility. Um, and adjustments to interview is extremely important to raise beforehand. Um, we all want to ensure that we are um, making adjustments wherever possible and appropriate. So getting in touch with each of the individual medical schools about any adjustments that should be anticipated, might be anticipated by a candidate is really important. Not reading everything on student room. <laughs> is important too. Unfortunately, there are an awful lot of rumours. I've had a meeting with my team this morning who have been getting increasingly anxious about the um, lies that there are on student room because what it's doing is people are winding other people up and it's very difficult. I know people want information. The Medical Schools Council uh, pages are the ideal place to find all the information and each individual medical school will be sending out additional information um, for the candidate. Um, if people have, and they're online, if they have any Wi-Fi concerns or um, concerns about the IT requirements, so having stable Wi-Fi, PC with audio and visual, then please again raise that with the medical school because they will try to assist and work with each candidate to try and identify appropriate um, resource for them. Um, just another couple of points, no clinical knowledge is required. Um, we teach that at medical school so whilst they're presented at scenarios with scenarios we don't expect any clinical knowledge work experience we're all fully aware of the reduction in a huge range of activities that candidates who are applicants healthcare courses may not have been able to carry out and so we have adapted our processes accordingly and there are statements on that in the medical schools council website finally just one line of what our actual format is at Leeds it's online it's live, so this year it will be a live interaction, eight stations of six minute duration each, one interviewer per station who will be scoring against predetermined rating scales. And all candidates that are made an offer will be invited to a visit day afterwards, face-to-face um, -face interviews, part of the process about that is not just us finding out about the candidate, but then finding out about the, um, the university because we moved to online, then we're making sure that that activity is still available in the time frame that a candidate would need to make a decision whether or not they want to come to Leeds. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Gail. Some more great advice there. Uh, Drew, anything from the Manchester perspective? Yeah, again, colleagues have covered um, and thanks, Gordon, for that uh, for that talk. Really, really excellent in, in terms of describing it. So I'll, again, I'll keep it brief. I'll just talk about the differences with the Manchester interview. So we are offering candidates this year and next year. Uh, the plan is that we're, we're offering candidates the choice of whether they're interviewed face to face in person um, or uh, online using using Zoom. 
Uh, we have five stations. Each station lasts eight minutes. So again, a variation on the on the theme. We have slightly fewer stations. We used to have seven. Uh, we reduced that at the start of the uh, pandemic, but we increased the length of the station, uh, and we're sticking with that approach for now. Our interviews are very conversational. So uh, the UK medical schools, Manchester, puts a, a really huge emphasis on communication and communication skills, and our interviews reflect that. Um, and we have a very conversational style. We want to find out about you. We don't have any numeracy tests or anything like that. We rely on uh, your your GCSEs. We rely on your, um, uh, your your UCAT, for example, as a good measure of uh, of academic uh, attainment and aptitude. Uh, so we don't have group tasks and we don't have uh, numeracy tests. We do have a lot of scenarios. Um, so you have several scenario based stations in your uh, in your Manchester interview and the interviews will prompt you and they'll try and engage you in a discussion. So as colleagues have said, um, pre prepared answers really don't work for the Manchester interview um, because we're actually looking for you to get into a discussion with the interviewer um, as, as well as in not, it's not just a case of you telling us um, or us firing questions at you. Um, we want to see we, we want you to have an opinion. Um, so we like to push you. Uh, our interviews are very friendly uh, and our interviewers are very friendly and we try and get you as relaxed as possible because we get the best out of you when you're when you're relaxed. Um, but we will push you and we will ask you for your opinions on things. Uh, and what I will say is, is, is candidates, or particularly if it's an ethical topic or uh, it's about you know, the, the issues in the media at the moment, sometimes applicants are worried about having an opinion. And, and I just want to say there are very few right and wrong answers um, in, in an MMI uh, scenario based station, you know, you need to have a balanced opinion, you need to be able to see both sides of an argument. Um, and, and whatever you conclude from that argument is personal to you. It's the process of going through uh, that, that reasoning that's important. And, and finally, from me, we use good medical practice again. So have a look at the GMC, uh, the, the GMC website. We like discussion. Test your connection if you're doing an online uh, interview. Test your connection before, particularly if you don't use Zoom. Um, test it and, and make sure your connection uh, is stable. Contact as if you're if you're worried. Um, as Gail said. Um, we run a lot of interviews, so we're interviewing 1,600-ish students this year, um, and we have interviewed up to 1,800 um, in, in the past. I also have lots of dentistry interviews and physician associate interviews, so my team are running just short of 3,000 interviews this year. Um, so please do bear with us. It does take us several months um, to, to get through everyone. I know that seems like an eternity if you've just had your interview this side of Christmas. It will take us a long time to get through. Uh, to get through. And again, beware student room. Student room is wonderful entertainment for admissions leads because um, we can go on there and we can see um, all the sorts of fantastic stories that people are, um, are inventing. But please do take it with a pinch of salt. Yeah, I think um, the student room is interesting. You, no one knows why someone got into medical school other than the medical school that did the the application. So you, it's very common to see that the shadowing of the top neurosurgeon was absolutely the way that people got into medicine. That that might be the case, but it's more likely to be the way that the student reflected on the ethical situation that they were given as part of their MMI that, you know, scored them very well. Um, I think there's a tendency to get into a little bit of an arms race um, for application, and it really isn't needed. I, and I hope you can see that um, all of the admissions deans here um, are nice, friendly people, and they want the candidates to do well. I think that's, you know, it is difficult, but it's not a trick. Um, it is just about engaging with that process as honestly as you can, certainly being prepared, but not being rehearsed. So uh, we haven't got many questions. Um, I'm not sure if the question and answer is working. I, Harry's put one in the chat. She did, but then it disappeared for me. Oh, she's put it into uh, chat. So um, what would be the one piece of advice you would give to students to remember when attending interview? Gordon, I'll start with you. So Liz, the answer I'm going to give is probably not the answer people want to hear, which is you have to be yourself. There's no point pretending to be somebody you're not and getting a place at medical school on the basis of characteristics you don't have because you're just setting yourself up for years of misery. 
Um, so you really do need to remember we're trying to find out about you as a person, uh, to find out what you think about things, what you found out, what experiences you've had. So remember to tell us about yourself, not about abstractly what doctors need to be good at. Make sure you're getting across what you're good at and how that's going to be relevant. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Gail, do you have anything to add to that? We've all said something in life we wish we hadn't done. Um, with a multiple mini interview, then remember the stations are scored independently. So if one station doesn't go so well, then try and take that deep breath between stations, put that smile back on your face and go for it with the next station because nobody else in that circuit will know how you've performed. Mm. You have more than one chance to make a first impression with MMIs, which is worth bearing in mind. Afshan, anything from you? Yeah, I think I was going to just say, be yourself. Speak in the way that you normally speak. We don't expect you to use long words or medical terms because obviously we're going to teach you all of those things. And listen to the question or read the question, honestly. That is so, so important. And answer the question that is being asked or that you've read. Fantastic. Drew? Be yourself. Um, but you don't have to be perfect. We're not looking for perfection. And it's OK to have failings as a person. It's OK if we ask you, you know, about something that went wrong. Um, what we have seen recently is a lot of people this week trying to turn weaknesses into strengths. And they've clearly been on some interview coaching course. Um, but, you know, it's OK. You know, we, we, are, we are people as well. and We make mistakes and, and you can, too. You don't have to be perfect. Yeah, that's really good advice. I've got a question here. Um, what if students are concerned about how they come across, for example, if they have a stammer, that sort of thing? Um, I'm sure that you will do training with your interviewers as well. Um, Gail? Yes, yeah, so um, I've just trained 200 interviewers for this cycle. So they are experienced academics and clinicians. And um, our patient care community as well and we are used to making adjustments on course some of our activities uh, particularly are around our clinical um, assessments of students are very akin to what we're doing in a multiple mini interview and so these are experienced individuals who have a set marking schedule and it is the information has to come across but they're not marked down for the format that it comes across. One of the things I think is really important is people aren't there to trip you up. So don't be scared of the interviewers. They're actually there to ask you a series of questions in a set format, but nobody's actually there to keep anybody out of medical school. And so it's, I think people's fear and anxiety sometimes can get the better of them. So again, if that happens and somebody's feeling really anxious beforehand, take those moments before the interview starts to chat to other people, to get yourself in that frame of mind, to try and allow yourself to perform the best. And if somebody has particular um, things that they're very concerned about, which again are related to uh, their ability to access the stations and to perform at their best, then maybe that's time that they need to have a discussion with their school and college and with the medical school before the interview so that we can provide specific advice. Absolutely. Reasonable adjustments, um, definitely available but cannot be made unless you as unless you talk to the medical school. So there's no use turning up on the day and saying, I need this reasonable adjustment. Schools need time to put those in place and they need you to tell them in advance. Um, and that's good practice for once people are students as well, because they medical schools need to know so that they can support you. They can't support what they don't know. So it's really important that everyone is open and honest, uh, which is in fact a part of good medical practice as well. Um, Gordon, did you have anything to add? Not really. It's um, just to be aware that there's a difference between making an impression and requiring extra time because of a severe uh, speech impediment, for example. So in various ways, we will tell our interviewers when we're training them what they should and should not be paying attention to. And we'll all be telling them you do not pay any attention to how somebody is dressed, 
how they look or how they speak. Now, obviously, they need to be able to make themselves understood, but accents or inability to use long words, as Afshan said, that those are not issues. Uh, having some kind of speech impediment that means people have to listen carefully to you, there's no problem with that at all. Interviewers should be listening carefully to you. It's only if you're going to need extra time that you need to be uh, doing more formal things with it. Absolutely. Uh, Drew? Yeah, again, colleagues have covered most of it. I'll just expand slightly on that. So I'll put in the chat um, a link to the occupational health standards because we've had a, quite a few um, students, uh, applicants contact us recently worried about, uh, you know, uh, speech impediment or worried about another disability, um, be it a, a mental health issue or a physical health issue. Um, again, don't worry, we, we support medical students from all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, I had a, an applicant uh, who was in a wheelchair who was very worried um, earlier on um, this this week, and you know, we we can support we can support medical students with a huge range of abilities, um, and uh, and and we we don't consider that as part of the interview process. So we will uh, run you through the same interview process, um, and then we will deal with any occupational health needs uh, separately uh, separately to that. But please do contact us. Um, if there's anything that you think uh, might affect your ability to either study medicine, practice medicine, or, or take part in the interview. Yeah, um, MSC has advice um, for applicants with a disability, which hopefully will get popped in the chat soon as well, just to reassure them that, you know, everyone, all medical schools are experienced at doing this, and, you know, they have processes in place to support students. Afshan, do you have anything to add? And can I start with the next question as well with you, which is yeah. what sort of dress code do you suggest? Okay, so finishing off with the other one, with the other one much like everybody else, you know, the, the training of our assessors is really important. So we go overboard with training them and they are very aware of how to deal with people with different uh, requirements. When we send out our invitation letter, they're, you know, in in there it states that if for the interview you have additional requirements or anything like that we will accommodate you so there's a lot of support there and much like they will get when they are students with us um now being old i've forgotten your second question it was about dress code sorry Ashad. <laughs> <laughs> I know I look like I'm going to the moon. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so in terms of dress code, we say to um, people in the invitation letter that smart casual is um, is required, but if they appear in a T-shirt in our training again with our assessors, we do say to them that, you know, uh, the dress code is not that um, relevant so they can if they want, they can make a comment in, in their marking, but it doesn't really have any relevance on our um, selection process or in the marking of the MMIs. Um, so that's a really important thing for people to understand. And the other thing is that at Aston, as I'm sure at every other medical school there is, we do offer, you know, even though we do our uh, interviews online, we do offer that if a candidate doesn't have a quiet space in their school or in their home, they can actually come to Aston and we will provide them with a, a laptop, we will provide them with a space so that they can sit and they can do their online interview quietly and, you know, in a space that they can think. So Fantastic. that's a really important aspect of online interviews not everybody has a an ideal space at home and again in our training we tell our assessors in case they are doing it from home where their kids jumping about or doors shutting and opening those kind of things and um, to be understanding of that situation Absolutely. i hope that answers your question no, it does it's a really good answer and i think one of the things about the pandemic is that we are all so much more used to the sort of daily life intruding sometimes unavoidably in our working lives so i think that's something that um, all of the interviewers probably are, are well aware has happened over the last three years does anyone want to add anything on dress code gail just that sometimes dressing smarter makes us focus in a particular frame of mind so if you're very casually dressed it may be that you're then speaking very casually so some candidates have said actually getting into some more formal clothes has helped them get into the headspace required for an interview 
But I agree with everything Afshan said that you're not going to be marked down for a particular type of dress. Yeah. I think that would be something from my personal working life. If I'm dressed for work, I do feel more like I'm, you know, ready to work. So, um, Gordon. I'd agree with Gail. I'd say generally as as smart as you're comfortable with. You, you don't want to be thinking about your clothes all the time because you're uncomfortable in them. Um, but I think Gail's right. It does focus you a bit if you dress differently from how you do all the time. But don't spend money on it. So... We wouldn't expect students from families that are short of money to be spending money on interview clothes, just whatever they've got that's as smart as they can manage. Absolutely, really important. Point. Like one point with regards to face to face interviews, because one of the things that I like about doing interviews online is I don't have to face complaints from my interviewers every year about offensive dress. So every year beforehand, I would get interviewers complaining to me about a female interview candidate whose skirt was too short. Um, for males, it was usually just their suit was too shiny, so it wasn't uh, really so severe. But they should not be wearing anything that's going to be offensive to anybody. OK. Uh, Drew? <laughs> Again, as colleagues have said, we being smart is is a good plan but we've had everything over the years we had the lady whose car broke down and she changed the tire at the side of the road on the way to her interview so she arrived covered in oil and grease um we've we had the man who um like the guy who was traveling and the baggage handlers lost his luggage so he did his interview in shorts and t-shirts in the middle of uh, february in manchester we've we've had everything and both of those people became medical students yeah absolutely life happens um so there's a interesting question um around feedback quickly um what sort of feedback are you able to now when i ask this question i'm going to just circle back to something drew said about having interviewed 3000 people um and i think that does have a bearing on the amount of feedback that can reasonably be given so does anyone want to start off with feedback drew would you like to yeah Yep, so we do give people feedback. Um, you do need to request it. Um, so we, we we put some basic feedback on the decision um, uh, via um, uh, by, that you get via UCAS track. Um, but um, if you're particularly looking at interview feedback, uh, we will give applicants interview feedback. Uh, so after your interview, it will take us a couple of months to get through it. So our interviewers do make some comments uh, on their scoring forms as they're, as, they're, as they're commenting. They only have a minute or two to do it between candidates. Uh, so it may just be a few words. So what our admissions team do is they look at the form and they will give you some feedback based on based on that form. But because we're giving feedback to um, you know, thousands of students, it, it does take a few months to, um, to, to get that feedback to you, but we hope it's useful. Yeah, I can imagine. Anyone else got any comments on feedback? Yep. Uh, yeah, so we do give feedback, but again, as with Drew, we do it on request. So we'll tell you what decile you were in, in terms of the ranking post MMIs. And um, for those who are given very low marks, we do ask our assessors to write the comment why they were scored low. So it's helpful for those young people to know where they can improve. Fantastic. Gail. We used to, we got um, to this respond by request only. Um, we got to the stage we had over 500 requests every year. So it became unfeasible. So we provide generalized feedback for the cohort. And I know it's not ideal, but it's just a feasibility thing. Yeah, sure. Gordon. On request, we'll usually only give the scores for each of the tasks in the interview. Like Aston, we ask interviewers to write comments if they give very low scores, but generally it requires another step of asking for it before we'll give that, because we don't want to give comments out to everybody, because in most cases they're not relevant. It's really only when they've got very low scores that those comments are relevant. Okay, so we are almost at time, but I know Gordon's going to know the answer to this one. Yeah. Um, where is the best place to find up to date news on on what's happening in medicine? I, see, uh, I if there were, I don't think there is one. Okay, if there was, I wouldn't tell you because it's exactly okay. what we don't want students on a PBL course to do to all go to the same site. 
that, that is an absolutely fair answer. I mean, I just think generally the newspapers, I mean, if I was to put some money on what might possibly be in an ethical station, I might guess strikes. Um, you know, that sort of thing. It's just about looking at what's in the news and thinking what will have caught the question writer's eye and what will they have thought, you know, oh, we must ask students about that. I don't know anything about what's in anyone's MMI, so I can say that. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for joining us today. And a huge thank you to Gordon, Afshan, Gail and Drew. I think that's been um, really good good loads of really good advice in there um and very enjoyable as well um so thank you for everyone um who attended today this will get recorded and it will go on our youtube channel so thank you very much everyone and we'll see you in the new year <laughs>